This evening we are here to talk a bit about uh, digital identifiers in IOTA. That's where Jelle is uh, also taking part in, my, in our combined speech. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, industrial sensors and how IOTA could be uh, of benefit um, for industrial sensors. Um, let me just introduce myself. Um, as Mr. Stork already introduced me, I'm uh, Karlsruhe guy, um, I did my mechanical engineering studies here. That was the beginning, then I did a diploma in the interfacultative um, studies in mechatronics here in Karlsruhe, so it's some kind of a home game. Um, then I did my PhD at the Institute for Applied Computer Science, and uh, what are my interests? I'm in electronics a lot. Um, um, of course, computer science, and um, in the meantime, we founded a company out of an industrial sensor company at Mannheim, Peppel and Fuchs, and this company is called Neoception, and there I'm now the managing director. Um, some of my teammates are here, uh, so you can have a chat with them later, if you like, uh, about not only this, what we are presenting here, um, but also the, the other work which we are doing. We are a corporate startup, and um, of course, if you're running a corporate startup, you're getting more and more into business. So developing this business is also one of my um, favorite tasks at the moment. But sometimes it's also cool to play tech again. And that's basically the team. Um, we have currently 10 full-time employees. Uh, we have various partners um, together. Um, we're, for example, an SAP partner. We're developing cloud-first applications for industry. And there we are focusing on the uh, value-added services, which then can bring, um, as a software, as a service, for example, bring a benefit to um, our customers. Our headquarter is in Mannheim, but we are quite distributed uh, team. So two of us live here in Karlsruhe. That's why it's also a home game for them. Um, and what we are doing is we are, we are building digital products and, um, yeah, and try to be successful here. Then we just do the introduction of Jelle. He will, he will go on with the, with the first part of the talk, uh, introducing uh, the ID to you and the concepts behind it. And then I will jump in and see how this is integrated in the industrial marketplace of Yoda. So it's your stage, Jelle. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so the um, microphone is working, I think. Uh, so, my name is Jelle Millenaar and I work for the IOTA Foundation as a software engineer. I'm just curious, is anyone here from outside of Germany? Please raise your hand. Okay, so I'm not the only reason we're speaking English tonight. That's good, uh, good to hear, good to see. Um, so yeah, my uh, work at the IOTA Foundation is mostly focused on the Unified Identity Protocol, which we very recently uh, shown our white paper from. Um, and yeah, this is how you can uh, contact me if you find uh, this talk interesting afterwards. Um, for those unfamiliar with the IOTA Foundation, uh, I doubt there are a few. Uh, I doubt that there are a few, but we're about uh, 110 people by now. We've grown from like four people at the start in only two years. Um, and yeah, our focus is really on uh, research and development of the IOTA protocol, but also to um, yeah help adoption move forward. Uh, so tonight I'm going to talk a little bit as an introduction to the Unified Identity Protocol. Um, so uh, that is actually used in the industry marketplace, which uh, the follow-up uh, will talk about then. And in the end I'll actually come briefly back to show how it exactly is used. So uh, hopefully that will make sense all down the line. Um, so the problem with uh, interacting online is that you can't really trust anyone online because you can't identify them. Like, how do I know who I'm dealing with online? I can look at their Facebook page, uh, I can look at their LinkedIn profile, and then uh, hope that they're not lying on there. Uh, I can ask Google for a bunch of information about you as like an advertising company. Uh, they can give you a nice educated guess uh, of someone's identity. But it doesn't necessarily mean that's true. All those identities are just estimation born from processing and harvesting lots of data. 
so what we're really looking for with, uh, with a digital identity is a way to identify someone or something online in a very reliable manner where you can actually say, I trust this identification completely and not every single company has to go through this entire process again and again. Because that's what's currently happening with, uh, uh, let's see if I understand the pointer. Oh, you can't see that on the screen. Uh, with the know your customer process. Like every company does not know your customer uh, about you, starts gathering a lots of data without your permission sometimes, and then they know they can trust you. I was once talking to a Dutch bank which proudly said, we're very secure about our identities of our customers. We, we put 100 million euros every year into this. Well, that's 100 million euro you can save by using such a protocol. Um, so that's what the Unified Identity Protocol really tries to solve. On the right side, you see the, the difference to how the current state is on the left side. Um, so instead of having imprecise identification, we get verifiable identification. So you can really trust uh, that someone uh, is giving the correct data. Uh, this data is actually managed by that uh, entity directly. So if it's a person, you start to really own your own data, and that's the concept of self-sovereign identity. Uh, that's actually where many identity solutions built on blockchain currently are working towards. They're working towards a self-sovereign identity for people. But we, we want to go beyond that, right? We're IOTA, and with IOTA we're building a protocol which is for the Internet of Things, mostly. So what we're looking at is not just an identity for people, but also beyond that. Um, yeah, the standard things for an identification protocol online uh, consists of also minimum disclosure. So once you share your identity online, you can only disclose exactly what is needed. So if I have to prove that I'm 18 to buy alcohol online, I can just prove that, hey, I'm above 18. You don't need to know my entire passport number and identification and those kind of things. No, just above 18 is fine. Um, yeah, and so the protocol that we're developing is just based on standards which have been developed uh, by the W3C community group, um, which are DID and verifiable credentials, and that makes us interoperable uh, with solutions from other blockchains, which means once they realize that those blockchains are very expensive, they'll obviously all move onwards towards IOTA. So the concept is based on verifiable credentials, which is basically an online or a, a statement about someone or something which is backed by an authority on the subject. So the authority is an issuer. The issuer basically backs the information and says, I've done my due diligence. I know that this person in these has a diploma because I'm the university where he studied at. And that's a very good issuer. So when I uh, show my diploma from my university and you recognize, hey, that's the university, then you know you can trust my diploma. But that's, that's a very human um, example. So let's dive into a little bit more about like, how, how would that work for devices? And with devices, it's, it's like uh, authenticity. Uh, can you prove that the device really is from the company that uh, it claims to be developed from? That's how you can make sure that parts are uh, developed correctly and they're not just knockoff parts from uh, fraudulent activities and that guarantees uh, the quality um, and if we look onwards towards an industry marketplace where we're going to dive into in a little bit uh, you want to provide a service as a device you need to be able to prove as a device that you can actually do that service so you need to prove your attributes and if you can show that by showing a credential which states hey uh, I'm a, a Samsung device and Samsung claims that this device has these and this uh, attributes, so it should be able to carry out the task, then you know you can trust it. So we're building really trust online. And the verifier is then the party that wants to inspect this information and yeah, basically get to know someone or something online. Uh, so yeah, I've already mentioned it a little bit, identity for people, uh, that's what's really standard. Uh, that's what lots of talks talk about. Identity for organizations is also very important. It's actually the, the, the connecting part between people and things um, because the organizations often really know a lot about us. 
so they can also vouch for us on our information. Um, and at the same time, they produce the devices, so they can also give credentials to those devices, again, to enable those identities. Um, and if you really combine them all together, then you get the unified identity protocol, where it really doesn't matter who you're ac interacting with. Is it a person? Is it a device? Is it an organization? doesn't matter, as long as you get the job done. And that's what we want to do with one single protocol, make sure that every interaction online is smooth, irregardless of what kind of device or person you're interacting with. And that's also very important in the industry marketplace. So why, why is IOTA very important for this? Um, I started working on uh, digital identity, I think about two years ago, and uh, I, I honestly didn't know about IOTA yet. Um, but I realized that you need specific uh, yeah, traits for a platform to build those identities on. And one of them is being very neutral, and the other one is being free. Uh, if it's free, that means that identities are accessible to anyone. Like if I would put this on uh, a Bitcoin blockchain, then it might cost 50 cents to upload my identity. That's not a problem for me, but it might be a problem in Africa for some people as that could be a meal for them. So identity should really be accessible to anyone and anything as well. Because for example, if we're looking at a bigger company that produces lots and lots of devices and you want to post all those um, devices, their identities on a distributed ledger technology, uh, it can rank up to like millions of credentials and millions of identities you need to put on a distributed ledger. Well, multiply that with the 50 cents uh, transaction cost and it's going to be a very expensive thing. And the neutrality is very important in the fact that uh, the distributed ledger technology needs to be open and permissionless and completely public. Uh, there are other instances of blockchains uh, doing self-sovereign identity uh, that ask permission to enter uh, the blockchain. Well, that's just like another Facebook, right? They decide who can enter the system. We don't want that to happen. So that's the basics of, uh, of digital identity, which uh, powers the industry marketplace. Uh, at the end of the talk uh, of uh, Jörg, I um, will continue a little bit with uh, how exactly it is used and how it could be used further down the line as well. Perfect, thank you, Jelle. Um, I'll now continue with the a short introduction of the IOTA industry marketplace. Um, if we are looking into platform industry 4.0, um, then they are coping a lot with uh, the definition of what Industry 4.0 is and what it, what it needs for the future. And um, there's three points which they identified, and that's why I put in this slide from them. Um, they said, okay, we need three new ingredients for making Industry 4.0 um, happening. An added value, so that's basically what our company is also always looking for, the added value for the, for the customer. Um, we need to change from the intranet, so everything is on-prem, to an internet and an interconnected world. That's the second um, part. And, of course, this always needs to be on a neutral and uh, common standardized ground. Um, and putting all these three together, um, IOTA is one of the technologies which is quite well fits into these uh, new requirements. So what is the industry marketplace of IOTA? Um, it's made up of a cooperation between E-Class. E-Class is a semantic catalog. Um, I'm going into this in a bit more detail in a few seconds, um, where, you can, where you can describe purchasable goods, for example. Um, then University of Magdeburg, Helmut Schmidt University of Hamburg, um, and then of course, IOTA, uh, the company we wash, it's a spin-off of uh, Bosch, taking care of washing machines. And we, as Neoception, um, did a first demonstration on how IOTA could be applied to the application of WeWash and also to uh, industrial sensors. So what, is, what are the key features of this um, new marketplace? 
Um, of course, if you're, if you're starting from the left side, um, you see the platform industry 4.0, which brings in the baseline for everything, um, the semantic uh, contract language. So how is a contract between two members in this ecosystem be done? I will, I will explain you um, how this works. And the second very important part is the contract describing attributes. So the semantic language which clearly identifies four machines which want, want to communicate to each other um, what they are talking about. And um, this gives us the possibility to do together with decentralized IDs um, an autonomous, autonomous machine contract. Um, as soon as you add the option of IOTA to also do payments into it, you have quite a good um, marketplace. And everything um, in this marketplace is running on the Tangle. So everything is also immutable. So anyone can see which transactions have been taking place on which time. Um, of course, that it's all um, developed on standards of very open standards of platform industry 4.0, and that it's open source makes it also a very good basis for uh, future um, for future uh, yeah businesses which run on this uh, marketplace. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to the uh, concept of an asset administration shell. An asset administration shell is something which describes all the parameters, all the data w for a industry 4.0 component. So without an ad asset administration shell, a industry 4.0 comp uh, uh, component isn't an industry 4.0 component. Um, it contains everything. You can imagine from type data, so you're developing, for example, uh, a sensor, and this has a manual, it has some uh, certifications, everything is put into this ad asset administration shell of this single sensor. Um, but it also con describes the uh, specific, the device specific parameters like a serial number, um, the runtime, the last value which was read by the sensor. So everything over the whole life cycle. Um, it is comprised of models which can be um, some kind of hierarchic into uh, uh, separated into submodels and built out of this. Um, it has sem defined semantics. That's where we use E class in the E class catalog. And it always needs to have some kind of a standardized communication interface so that anyone who has the right to is able to access this data within this asset administration shell. And this is one of the, one of the core components which also went into the um, into the uh, industry marketplace. So why do we use semantics? Um, at the moment, um, when, when we are creating value-added services, uh, today we have devices, we have some kind of connectivity, then we are talking into some kind of a platform, and then a user application is running on top. If you match that with components from, from our company, from, from Pebble and Fuchs, you have sensors here, you have some kind of interconnectivity, you have some kind of gateways, in between, and this sends then data to some cloud platforms like AWS, uh, uh, Azure, whatever you, you want to call it. And if you have a second application, then this second application resides parallel to it. And um, anyone who's designing such kind of an application um, puts in some kind of uh, semantic. They define a key value pair. Um, someone call it target distance. In the other uh, application, it's perhaps only called distance. So what happens is the user application too can never use any data, even if it has access to the, to the database um, from, this, from this other uh, first application. And um, what the semantics do now is if you um, have data which is tagged by a semantic ID, this is basically how the identifiers within E class look like, um, then you have the key is the uh, semantic identifier, and the value is, um, and within the semantic identifier, not only the type of the, of the value is defined, but also the units and everything you need to understand what this 10 means. And um, of course, if you do this, then you can exchange data between applications, and you can uh, separate the, um, trans the uh, generation of the data from physical values into data from the usage of the, of the application itself. 
um, how does E-class look like? I have an example here. Um, most of the parameters within E-class are um, describing hardware products which can be sold because that's where they come from. It's a purchasing standard. It describes a, a, a device by all its parameters. If you look into it, we have here an example on our, from our industry, a one-way light barrier, and this has, of course, a brand. It has some kind of a, a control output. Um, is it, uh, has it, does it have an explosion protection category? Everything is uh, defined. And um, if you look into it more deeply, and if you select something like a, a real value, there's a switch frequency, which has some kind of a format, which has a unit of measure, and which has a human readable uh, semantic definition. And this is always used to describe the, um, to describe the data, which is uh, then offered at the industry marketplace. If you want to have a look inside, there's an uh, eclasscontent.com website where you can browse through it and can build a picture out of it. Um, and <clears throat> you need to take care that you're only using it for evaluation purposes because otherwise you need to um, order a license for it. So they are currently working on it, um, how to make this uh, available. So the first uh, demo which we built uh, together with E-Class and IOTA was we built such kind of a demonstrator. The demonstrator has here a rotating plate with uh, some sensors on it, has all the interface, and then sends up the, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, sends up the data to a, a cloud application. And the fun part in this demonstration was um, all the data is sent with these semantic uh, IDs. And um, if you have some kind of a counting application, for example, which just counts how many of these bins passed by, um, then you can either use the signal of a light barrier, which gives you a semantic presence information of this, of this container. Is there one or is there none? This counts then the device. And then you can unplug, you can unplug this light barrier and replug some kind of an RFID uh, read hat, and then um, you're able to also use the presence information created by this RFID read hat to uh, exactly uh, use it in the same algorithm um, with the exact same uh, semantic ID because now you're independent of um, the, um, of the, uh, yeah, the, the, all the, the data um, acquisition. So if you want to give it a try, I'm now giving it a try, you can go to eclass.iota.org and there's still a simulator running um, for this, let me see where it is. So this is eclass.iota.org. You can scroll down. Um, the third machine here is our real demonstrator, um, but this is switched off at the moment because it, uh, it's owned by eclass, um, and they only switch it on uh, from time to time. But there are two simulators. You can click on uh, connect here. What happens then? A MAM channel from our browser is created uh, through the Tangle, through the, um, to the um, machine itself. Um, you then see here the E-Class properties, um, which, for example, year of construction and the brand is IOTA, um, and there's one output voltage. And if you click on purchase here, then we're doing a payment. And after doing this payment, um, you get access to the, uh, to the data. Um, and you get the, um, the real-time data streamed through a MAM channel um, on, the, on the Tangle. So that's basically what happens there. Output watch is now 9, and now the, um, the values should come in. So you can give this a try later by yourself. Um, it works quite well. So that was the first, let's say, incarnation of, of this uh, demonstrator. Let's come back to the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, what now is the characteristic of the industry marketplace, and how does that fit into it? Um, on the one hand side, um, we, have, we have a concept of a service provider and a service requester. So the service requester wants to access some data. So they ask, okay, uh, could you please uh, give me some data? And of course, on the left hand side, that's the official slide. Um, you can have such a complex machine like a robot. Um, but you can also add a sensor here. 
and then the sensor has some kind of a distance value. You can also imagine having a sensor network for um, temperatures, for example, and um, the temperatures then are available and the service requester can request to the industry marketplace who can offer me the outside temperature compliant to the weather standards uh, in a certain area and then can request this service directly um, from the sensor. So what we did is we wrapped this demonstrator with an asset administration shell where the E-Class content is inside. We attached the market manager to it, and then with this, it's able to um, provide the data, um, which can then be requested by another party who's also using the market manager um, from, the, from the industry marketplace. So you can also give it a, give it a try on industry.iota.org. Another demo. Now let's hope that it's working. We'll see that no one uploaded anything. Um, so that's basically the, uh, the standard user interface of the uh, market manager. You can now file a request here. Just create a request. For example, sensor data. You can fill in some random values. Submit it. Um, now what we are doing is we are, we are filing a request which is then published to anyone um, who is subscribed to this, to this request. Um, if we now switch over so to our... Uh, doesn't look too good. So they already... Ah, no, they didn't break it. So one refresh was okay. Cancel this one. Confirm, create a new one. So I'm using my mobile connection here. It's quite flaky. So we'll see. We now file a request, and then we'll get a, we'll get a response on the other side. Oh, I did it with the, ah, here's my sensor data request, exactly. So just did that. We can now uh, send a proposal, let's say, we say to them, okay, we will provide this data for 10 IOTAs. Um, take some time. Because all these transactions are going over the tangle. Um, then we're coming back. We see, okay, this, we got a proposal, cool. 10 IOTAs, we accept that. And if we accept it, then the next step is the fulfillment. So now the other party um, is doing something and uh, say, okay, this request now is fulfilled. So um, we, at the last step, need some kind of a payment. And of course, now I'm again back. Now we are paying for the, for the request. And this is also going via the Tangle. Now it's synchronized because now the, the IOTAs are transferred. And um, now we sold this sensor data. If you look into the sensor data, you can see all the transactions. Um, they, they are currently fetched from the, um, you see, ah, by the way, you see now the, the sensor data also coming in as it's a demonstration, it's some kind of old data, um, but this also works. This is now a mem channel which we're looking inside like the, the previous demo where you can also send the, the live data. And here you see um, first call for proposal, um, then this, the next step, you see all the, all the transactions, the call for proposal, uh, you see the acceptance of the proposal, and everything is um, also immutable, documented on the, on the Tangle. So, short deep dive into, into tech. How is it working? Um, our uh, gateway somehow uh, talks to the, um, to the market manager. The market manager has two uh, interfaces. The first one is a, a zero message queue, um, where it fetches all the incoming transactions. Um, it's uh, uh, with the socket I.O. implementation. Um, this is quite hard if you're doing C-sharp stuff. There are some people doing this. Um, uh, but in the meantime, we also added in, there's also an MQTT uh, uh, interface for that. And of course, you have a uh, REST API where you can put all the first config, then um, do all the proposal, accept, reject, um, and uh, all these operations via the, via the um, REST API. Um, 
this is all open source, so you can check it out and download it and play around with it if you like later on. And that's basically the protocol. First, a call for proposal. This protocol, by the way, is defined um, in Industry 4.0 um, consortia. So this is exactly how uh, a transaction between two uh, machines should take place. Um, as soon as you have the payment, the optional last step is to subscribe to this MEM channel, which is then opened um, to really get the data out of it. Um, I put into the presentation also some kind of deep dive how, how this looks like. Uh, you also see it, how, um, how it works if you're clicking through the, the um, demo in the, in the internet. Um, here you also see the DID, um, which is basically work of Yelle and the invention of Yelle. That's why it's a really, uh, really an honor to be here with him today. Um, you see all the data elements and um, what is, um, what is uh, requested comes in here into the submodel elements, which also can be described in this, in this notation um, with, the, um, with the semantic IDs. And then you send it over. Um, then you get a proposal in the same way. It's uh, identified with the same conversation ID. Um, and then you get the, uh, the proposal um, back. There are more steps. Um, you can check them out under this um, uh, URL um, on, the, on the GitHub uh, of the IOTA Foundation. Demo already done. Why are we doing this? Um, of course, it's fancy. That's why we're doing it. We can work together with cool people. That's also one, one uh, part of it. But of course, we also want to do business on that. We will not do business in the next days or something like that, but um, we um, are looking quite forward, let's say two to three, five years, something like that. Um, what we have is some kind of a battery powered uh, sensor with wireless interface, which is well prepared to do cryptography. Um, and then you can imagine, of course, uh, doing some, some cool things with it. Um, Two examples is smart city, smart logistics. If you're looking, uh, in, for example, into consignation storage, where um, you have a silo which belongs to a, a supplier of uh, mortar, for example, um, then you uh, can, then this mortar belongs to the supplier and it's only sold if the consumer removes it from the silo. And of course, in this transaction, where payment is, is done in the background, it's very interesting that you have trusted that you have trusted information, and um, for example, this this uh, this data can be sold via the uh, industrial marketplace. You can be creative. There are thousands of other ideas, and um, we see quite some quite something in this technology, and that's why we're we're doing it. So now I hand back over to Jelle for the last thoughts why we're doing it. Yeah, thank you. So um, I think what was really cool uh, to see is that we're really trying to uh, uh, standardize the, the data layout and the interaction. And what the Unified Identity Protocol then does is standardize the trust. So what currently is happening in the industry marketplace is actually relatively simple because there are two levels of trust. You're either trusted by the system or you're a new player. Um, actually, in the demo just now, we're using a new player. So if you would uh, filter by trusted uh, transactions, actually his uh, request and proposal both wouldn't come up uh, because he isn't trusted, apparently. <laughs> but uh, so, so how to get trusted is actually, uh, at the moment, just ask the IOTA Foundation, hey, uh, I'm this person or uh, I'm, giving, uh, I'm using this device on the industry marketplace, could you please white label us? And then what we do is we send a credential to your identity and state, all right, we recognize you, so now you're a trusted part of the system. Obviously, that's not super decentralized or uh, whatever like that, but it's more a demo to show uh, how to trust someone. And then there's also the question, then, how do you identify uh, that, that trust is actually uh, valid? So let's say uh, you hold an identity for a person as you're requesting something or as a device when you're providing something uh, and you want to show, hey, I'm a trusted entity in the system. So you say, all right, I'm trusted and I, um, 
then I say, all right, prove it to me. If you're trusted and you claim to be the owner of this DID, which is a unique identifier, um, I, sh I see you have a credential for this DID, which states you're trusted, but can you prove that you're the owner of the DID? So what I do is I send you a challenge. And the challenge could literally be just sign something with the number 42 in it, or 104, or whatever, right? And as long as they're able to sign it, which proves that they're owner of the DID, that means that they're also uh, the party to be trusted. And that's what's going on during the messaging that you were showing uh, before. Uh, you also sometimes saw a verifiable credential being communicated, a challenge being communicated, and the challenge being answered with a signature. And that really proves that you're the owner of that identity to be trusted. Um, so that's what it's doing right now. But as you may, see, uh, may have seen during the talk, there are actually way more opportunities. So um, when you're really starting to deal uh, with services on such a platform, you often want to do a KYC for at least the people that are going to use it. Um, and anyone can deliver that service, not just the IOTA Foundation, right? Uh, as long as that KYC uh, organization is trusted by the industry marketplace, which can be decided on a local level, so like our instance right here can decide which KYC uh, companies they trust, uh, they can start giving out KYC and uh, say, all right, this is a trusted person in the system, they've already provided some services, so you can really trust that when they uh, say they're going to pay you, they'll actually pay you, and otherwise we'll revoke that credential. Um, but I think the most important one that I would like to highlight is that uh, the E-Class standardization properties that were mentioned, uh, they're currently just a property which you list. You state, all right, this is my standardized property and I have this. But it would be nice to actually prove that you have that. And that's where the verifiable credentials can come in once more, where you really prove I have these, uh, um, these properties for real. So that's actually, I think, a major opportunity that we still need to grasp. We, uh, we would really love to implement that. Um, basically, take the whole standard of E-Class, all their they have so they standardized so many devices, so that's really awesome, and allow devices to uh, prove that they have those attributes directly. Um, and yeah, when you really want to, for example, purchase data or service, um, then you want to make sure that it's a correct one. So um, we saw with with purchasing data, then I if I purchase data of GPS, for example of people walking around in this, uh, in this city, uh, then I'd love to make sure that they're actually people that I'm purchasing the data from and that they're actually living in the region or something like that. So you can really narrow down the data that you get and make sure it is trusted uh, for you. So there are still many more opportunities that we, can, uh, that we can take with the industry marketplace. This is not a project that we just built once together and then let it let it die or something uh it's going to be continuously uh improved um so yeah i hope you can uh, look forward to more features on this system and uh, i highly encourage you to try it out use it build some proof of concepts on top of it or maybe even build in some of these suggested improvements yourself uh, that's it for me uh, i guess any questions to both of us uh, i'm not sure how much time we have for them but Ooh, not, not no questions. Yeah, there, there's one. There's one. Very hesitating. But. So the E class um, found, E class foundation is one of these standards, and they and they are IEC standards, for example, also which could be in integrated into this, but we decided for E-Class uh, because they are currently opening. They are opening these um, standard parameters of a, of a device, size, color, a measurement distance, um, and they are, they are thinking about how to tag the data itself 
um, for uh, specifying the semantic meaning of, of uh, uh, data value. And um, that's why, why E-Class is um, very well suited for this, super, this marketplace where also data can be offered. Yeah. But there are for sure others. This is a very well-known catalog of semantic data. Very good question. How do you bootstrap the trust? Um, so if we're talking about this demo, it basically starts at the IOTA Foundation. You have to uh, let us know that you're working on this, and then we can make you a trusted entity. But obviously, that's not how you bootstrap the entire system. Uh, but how we would like to do it is eventually uh, create uh, more software to also manage your own identities as a, uh, as a company. So, for example, we can whitelist Neoception, and Neoception then can whitelist all of their own uh, sensors. So that means that they don't have to manually send, like, hey, can you whitelist this one identity of this one device, and here's another one, and here's another one to the IOTA Foundation. Obviously, that doesn't scale. Uh, so we bootstrap it by uh, the, allowing companies like Neoception to take part, to give them that trust to then sign up their own devices again. And then Neoception could also say, hey, but we, our mother company mm -hmm. uh, also has their devices and they want to sign up as well. So uh, we give out a credential stating that we trust them as well to give out the devices, um, to give credentials to their devices. And it basically becomes a little bit of a web of trust uh, where uh, you need to find a path uh, of trust between companies. Uh, so normally, uh, in a web of trust, you bootstrap it by just asking a bunch of people, hey, can you verify me online? Can you verify me as well? And then eventually you build trust. Uh, I think it would be better if we do that on an organizational level. Like organizations can really start to, uh, to give out that trust way more easily because they have their connections with other organizations and it scales way more rapidly. And then if you, for example, take on something like a Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I'm not sure what the German equivalent is, but I'm pretty sure there is one where every company registers and uh, they can give out the credentials stating, hey, this is a trusted organization. Um, then it really starts to uh, get going. So that's how you start to scale it up. So the, the ultimate goal would, of course, be that the sensor itself is taking place, is one of the, of the players in the industry marketplace, um, for sure. At the moment, we are doing it in a gateway because it consumes a lot of uh, the node is, is even running in the cloud at the moment, to, to be really honest. Um, but there are, there, are some, there are some works also of the Yoda Foundation to get this node into a highly constrained, uh, computation constrained device. And so that the, dev the device itself can be uh, one member of the, of the marketplace. I, I hope that answers your question. So of course this would be the, the, the track um, to go there, um, but we are not there yet. And, and that also means that the market manager will be run on that same device as well, right? Needs to, yeah. yeah. So then maybe that adds. In consequence. Yeah. Uh, so privacy is actually at the center of the entire identity protocol. Um, instead of sharing all the information, for example, you can do it uh, selectively. Uh, so privacy is very important. But what you're really asking, I think, is also the security of the data locally on that device. Is that true? If the, how we keep that secure? 
Um, that really depends on the device, honestly. Um, th that's not part of the uh, protocol directly. We assume that someone that wants to take part and builds a device uh, and wants to handle their own data, uh, that they can also make sure to secure it. Um, like, once we build a uh, data wallet app, for example, uh, for people, then we'll make sure, since we're building that application, that it secures the data as well. But on this part, uh, I guess that's up to the developers uh, themselves. But you can imagine that um, the, the seed and the encryption keys are often already on a secure element. Uh, you can decide, to, I'm not sure how, how big the storage there is, to maybe also store some of the credentials there, uh, if it's important. No more questions, I think. And thank you all very much for your attention. Perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> now we'll come to our second talk, Simone. Great. Can you all hear me? Wonderful. Um, my name is Simone Giel. I work for Zulka Engineering, um, an innovation and engineering service provider. What we do is we create products and services, hardware as well as software, for our, product, for our clients with our clients. And at the company, I'm responsible for everything around blockchain and DLT on the business side. Um, what I have to do a lot every day is explain to people who do not have any technical knowledge or knowledge whatsoever about blockchain or DLT, what blockchain and DLT is. Um, it already starts with the name actually. Blockchain is sort of a word that everyone knows now, but nobody really likes it. Plus, we are, for example, an official partner of the IOTA Foundation. Um, which is not exactly a blockchain traditionally, but then DLT, distributed ledger technology, is really not a sexy word. Um, which is why we mainly talk to business people about decentralized ecosystems, um, ecosystems in general and platforms. Well, to someone who, as I said, doesn't have a lot of knowledge about the technology and probably doesn't really want to understand it in detail, it's really important to explain why it's actually relevant for them to think about the technology now, um, what the benefits could be, and why they have to think about it now, although a lot of the applications might not really scale just yet. What's really vital is that traditionally, or generally, it's relationships which establish trust in business. However, I don't have to tell you that we're living in an increasingly globalized world. Um, it's not really possible anymore to meet everyone in person, um, which traditionally, if I have, a, have an, an, an important business partner, what I will do is meet them at least once a year to discuss what the business is, was like the past year, um, what's going to change next year, what the conditions are, and so on. So what's happening is that we're moving from bilateral trade, which is basically, I know my business partner, I have a supplier, maybe I have a vendor um, in the middle, and I have a consumer in the end, um, over to multilateral centralization. What that is, is I'm going to go a bit more into detail on um, what that is exactly, but it's basically a platform, right? Um, which, as we see today, really attack traditional um, bilateral trade. You see that a lot of the small little shops that we used to have in the cities are actually going away more and more, um, and it's really a lot of trade online and a lot of companies um, that have a bricks and mortar as well as an online business. What we do expect um, is that we're moving to, towards multilateral decentralization, which will in turn attack the, the nowadays nearly traditional um, centralized platforms. So let's look at the centralized platforms. Um, why are they so, exp so important and why are we using them? It's pretty easy, I guess. Nowadays, um, 
we have this increasingly globalized world where we don't actually know all our business partners. A lot of, of business is just happening over the internet, as we all know. How does trust still work there? Basically, as I said before, via centralized business platforms. Um, a few you see here. By the way, when I'm talking about platforms, I'm talking, that's why I'm saying here business platforms. I'm not talking about the technology behind it. I'm really talking from a business perspective. What does that basically look like? Let's look at Uber. Um, I don't, I'm just going to quickly go through it. You have a customer on one side, Uber in the middle, and um, the driver on the other side. I, as a customer, can send a request via the app to all drivers within um, a range X of myself. Um, the driver then comes, one, one, one accepts, comes, picks me up, conducts the service, brings me to wherever I want to go, um, and I pay via the app and the driver gets the money. That sounds really nice, but Uber receives around 42.5% of the fare, which is quite a lot thinking about the fact that Uber doesn't have to pay for insurance, Uber doesn't have to pay for buying the car, they're not responsible for anything um, with regards to customer safety and so on. So the question clearly arises as to why do we actually use these centralized platforms? And that raises to me the question, would you want to get in the his car? Or more importantly, would you want your girlfriends, your daughter, your wife to get in his car? Because let's face it, a lot of Uber drivers look pretty much like this, right? Um, so why do I actually use those two-sided centralized platforms? Why do you use, uh, use an app like Uber? It's pretty much, it gives me safety and trust because I see, for example, reviews. Um, and if a driver has been working there for a while, I would expect, you know, that I'm going to be safe, hopefully. So what the, the platform does is it creates a layer of trust. I would say, however, that you actually don't need Uber as an intermediary anymore nowadays. You could actually, from, from now the infrastructure, you could actually do this without Uber in the middle. And the question, and, and I still have that trust, because I can have a technology that doesn't belong to Uber and that allows my, me to write a review, for example, right? Um, and then going a bit further away from just one customer and one driver, I can look at an either, even bigger picture and say, well, you know, I can have, for example, an ecosystem of transportation um, that also enables that trust. So for example, there is no driver within a, within a um, range that I need. They can't get fast, they're fast enough or because there's so much traffic right now, um, it would take ages to get to my, to my destination. It could tell me, hey, maybe you want to go via public transport, for example, this is an option. And then you have that on the platform as well. So you're looking at a whole ecosystem where you have this trust, right? Um, this sounds all, all fancy and new, but I would say that the idea of such a decentralized or such an ecosystem that works interconnectedly is actually a one that, especially in European, like in the really, really traditional European um, industries, we will know. So let's think about eco ecosystems in the old world, right? Um, one idea is, for example, a milk farmer. A milk farmer has to put his milk out, pretty much milk his cows, put his milk out, and, and rely on someone to pick that milk up before it gets bad. Um, if that whole process lasts too long, the milk farmer will have like all of his processes that day delayed. And that's a bit of a difficult thing because, you know, usually that's just a little family. You don't, you can't just, you know, tell, tell your kids, for example, they have to wait, if you have a little child, they have to wait for you to do everything a bit later because the nanny or whoever was supposed to look after the child isn't here right now. Um, but the whole process was delayed and I have to do it now. Plus, it's really a whole process. So you have, first of all, the milk driver has to go out on time, right? Then you have a bunch of, of farmers that he has to get, to get to. And ultimately, 
um, the milk has to get in decent quality back to the company. If one little milk farmer is too late, for example, again, the whole process is delayed. So there is a really already an interoperable ecosystem there that works very closely together. So the idea shouldn't be that complex for us from a business perspective to understand. However, as this quote from the World Economic, from a report from the World Economic Forum shows, um, it is actually. So what the CEO of Klackner, for example, said is that from a rationale point of view, executives um, in his company understood that it makes, actually, it makes sense to work together with other players, even, um, even, even with um, people who might compete with them. However, emotionally, it's a bit difficult, right? We just don't want to. Um, and again, going back to the example before, for the milk farmers, that's not a problem. I mean, they are actually, all those little farmers could be seen as um, competitors, but they don't see themselves as, the, as such. However, as I said, in business, we often see each other like that. Um, which is, first of all, it's very counterintuitive to think in ecosystems. We have a very proprietary mindset with regard to data, and that's why the, the um, word competition paradox or the two words were actually coined. So it is a paradox for us to work together, to collaborate with our competition. However, on the other side, although there's some economic models that do allow um, to explore the thought, I think, we're all pretty sure that there is no real infinite growth um, in business, right? Plus, maybe it makes sense, and there's um, consumer trends out there right now who go very much into that direction, that you have to create mutual benefits, and that it's about that a company should create value beyond, um, that of its, uh, beyond its own value. Now, I don't know how many people who studied business are in here, um, but the father of traditional strategic thinking, Michael Porter, who's like, who developed the competitive strategies and so on, a lot of models that are about strategic thinking, he actually went back in 2011 and said, you know what, I think what I did so far was not enough. It's good to have a competitive advantage, that's all good, but you have to do, you actually have to create a value beyond your own company. And I think the father of traditional strategic thinking saying that means quite a lot. Now, there's another problem for us here in Europe, right? If we look at those, all those centralized platforms out there who are making all the business, we don't look too great. <laughs> so, you know, on the left, you have all the American um, major platforms. On the right, you have a lot coming up from, um, from Asia, especially China. Germany is still, you know, pretty good for Europe with SAP, but generally, it doesn't look too great. And maybe that's because we do have that collaborative mindset that I mentioned earlier from the more traditional industries inside. Looking now, thinking in ecosystems, as I've explained them earlier, isn't you know just the thought of an of an of a millennial that wants to change the world. It's actually something that all the you know strategic opinion makers, World Economic Forum, McKinsey all the big, um, the big strategic or the big strategy consultancies are saying we are moving more and more towards ecosystems and digital ecosystems that are expected to generate quite a lot of income and, and revenue by 2025. And they will be aligned along the customer journey. The question now, of course, is who actually owns this platform? Why would I build it and what do I get out of it? And who is it, is it in the end mine? Do I have to maintain it and so on? Um, and to that, I want to ask a different question. And I would expect someone here maybe to know it. Does anyone know who owns the internet? Come on, I thought this was a bit of a computer science <laughs> sort of crowd. Well, strictly speaking, <laughs> the internet, um, is owned by pretty much no one and at the same time by everyone. So 
First of all, you could say that everyone who owns part of the infrastructure, which I would assume is everyone in here, because every cell phone nowadays, every smartphone at least, is expected is 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 um, yeah said to be part of the infrastructure. On the other hand, it's everyone who has the who owns the content on it, which is the World Wide Web basically. But no one entity owns it, right? There's no like, there's probably entities who know a bit more, who own a bit more of it because they own more parts of the infrastructure. But generally, we all do know, own it in a way. And I think, again, the start isn't so far away from at least from what's happening in businesses or what's been happening in businesses for a long time in Germany. Because if you look at a lot of the hidden champions in Germany, what they do after a while is they set their company up as a foundation, which has, in Germany, you have to have a foundation that has a, a specific goal. I mean, that goal doesn't have to be do something good for the world. It could also be maintain this family forever. <laughs> But still, you do have a lot of foundations that actually have a goal and then just continue trying to achieve that goal. Um, and many look at, for example, even Microsoft nowadays donate a, a um, huge part of their money already and their revenues to, to a good cause, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for example. So this going away from just making as much profit as, as possible there is a trend out there in business that's changing anyhow a bit, right? So how does this work? So what could I do, however, as a business um, with, with DLT, with such a decentralized platform? Um, so Zilka is working cross industry, so I had just had to, to find one nice example that I could show you. Um, and what I'm telling you about now is smart building supply with low cost for investors. This is an example I like because in our building in Frankfurt, where I work, um, this is actually, this is actually, we actually have a problem with this. So traditionally, if an investor and most um, company buildings are built by investors that then, you know, lease it or are rented out to different companies, as an investor, what you're going to do is you're going to build that building with the requirements there are, and you're going to put all the equipment in that you need, but you're going to use the cheapest that, that's out there. Which means, for example, for and then you know it's it's pretty clear as a manufacturer, you sell that equipment to an investor, the investor puts it in, and then the tenant, well, he basically pays for it. Um, when, when he buys the building or rents the building. The difference now is, or the difficult thing now is that, for example, I'm using that example, blinds. Blind controllers, the smart blinds that you put in buildings, are usually already equipped to do everything they possibly could to like, have the perfect blind controlling. Really smart. But the, the functionalities aren't used because they don't sell, they basically don't sell the rights to use those functionalities to the, to the tenants. Which sucks because, for example, in our case, what's happening is in summer, the blinds go down completely. So the employees sit in the dark, so what they do is put the blinds up completely, which means higher cooling costs and so on. So like, it's actually, the costs for that are pretty high. And everyone is kind of annoyed with it. What could have happened um, is then just, you know, put the blinds in, sell, first of all, the, the basic functionality, and then give the manufacturer direct access to the tenant by, pay, by selling um, the option to use those functionalities by use, actually, to the tenant. And the tenant just pays directly to the manufacturer, which would be great because it's really just an additional revenue source. For, um, for the investor. And you can go through calculations, which I'm not going to do now in, in detail, but like the month monthly fee per use altogether would actually pre be pretty high, but still it's a win-win situation because the investor doesn't pay more than before, the manufacturer has an additional revenue source, and in this case, the tenant still has lower costs altogether in the end.
um, you can actually like you can actually do the the business case there, and it works. So let's break it down. What we really want to do, and I think what IOTA also wants to do, is they want to move from from IoT towards an economy of things. What we've done for a long time with with all those sensors is we put them in. We generate a lot of data. A lot, most companies don't really know how to harness that data. Of course, we have now a lot of AI, data science, and so on, and it's, uh, which enables harnessing set data. But this also, well, leads to a lot of questions as to how to secure that data. What are you know? Um, privacy, the privacy regulations, and so on. And that's actually where DLT comes in for us. DLT allows for the trust that is necessary in business, and it allows for security in an increasingly complex world. Also for people who don't actually, like, let's face it, consumers don't need to know that there's any DLT in there. But still, um, it will lead to a lot more security in the end. Thanks. Any questions? <laughs> questions? Yeah? So um, all of the above. When we initially started, that was before I, I joined Zulka, um, I think it was actually because we had employees who were interested in the topic and we, at Zulka we have a, um, a I think around 13% of our time we're able to dedicate to learning and to learning also what we want to learn. Um, and you can just say, well, I want to look deeper into that technology and then use that time for that. So this is how it started. Um, but then, you know, the topic came up more and more, and that was, that was a few years back. Um, the topic just came up more and more in the media, so customers started to ask. Um, and it's just a nice, it can be a nice door opener, let's face it, to talk to companies. Uh, but generally, it's actually that a lot of the companies that we work with really ask us about it. Sometimes really critical. Sometimes they actually, all they want to hear is that they're right in hating it. <laughs> Not always, but it does happen. Um, so, yeah. I think, honestly, the economy of things is just likely to happen because it's, if that answers your question, because we do have more and more devices and we want them to be able to communicate with one another and at some point we're going to be very happy the more we can automate things, you know, the more those devices communicate with one another independently. Um, and think, for example, about the example of aut autonomous driving. A, an, autom an autonomous car will still have the same needs as cars have today, right? Um, but there's not going to be, like, I'm not probably not going to own an autonomous vehicle because why would I? It's probably going to be, like, the, the studies at, at least say that it's going to be more car sharing, you know, sort of thing. Who's responsible for, for catering to the needs of an autonomous vehicle? I mean, 
if you're a Tesla and you're giving out these vehicles, you could say Tesla, but you know, you don't want one person, that's not the case, that's not the, the sense of automation. You don't want one person to sit there and start booking manually maintenance for that car. You want this to happen automatically, and that's, I think, there's, um, there's a lot of things happening out there right now that are just going to require the economy of things to work. You know, and with, with the autonomous car example, you may say, well, you know, you don't have really the, the, maybe you don't have the same degree of data privacy issues there. But there's a lot of examples when you look, for example, at healthcare, where you will have deep, deep need for trust. Does that answer your question? Currently, we are um, working on one that I'm not allowed yet to talk about, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I can't. We are working on one thing that's going to be announced hopefully in the beginning of next year. <laughs> All right. Thanks for your talk, Simone, and now we have a short break of 10 minutes, then we keep on going with the next presentations. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Normally I talk in front of different crowds like engineers and so on. Myself, my name is Martin Unterberg. I'm a mathematician working at an engineering institute, so I'm already kind of exotic. Now it's even more exotic to talk here on an IOTA meetup. Um, but I like exotic stuff, so I'll try my best to um, be as concise as possible to show you our proof of concept um, we develop with IOTA um, for a machine economy for selling digital twins um, in a special use case called fine blanking. Are any traditional mechanical engineers here today? Okay. Um, so that's not, not a lot, but um, I'll try to do my best to um, explain to you why fine blanking is the best um, production technology ever developed by humanity. And I will start um, with telling you where we come from, which is the Internet of Production, which is a term um, for our cluster of excellence at uh, the university in, in Aachen, um, where the currency is data, and you all know um, data and distributed uh, ledger technologies go well. So um, I think this is a pretty, good, um, a pretty good start. And then I will talk about monetization of manufacturing data. So, um, how we see monetization in manufacturing and um, how s even small businesses can develop new business models in manufacturing. And then I will show you a, s a small video of our proof of concept. Um, maybe someone of you have already seen it on, on Medium. My boss, Dr. Daniel Traut, is um, posting a lot on Medium. So if you want more information, you can just Google Industrial IOTA Lab Aachen and you will find a lot of blog postings and YouTube videos um, about our work. Um, yeah, sorry for not bringing the fine blanking machine, but it's 44 tons and my university only pays for a Golf, VW Golf. Um, but you have already in your life, I'm, I'm sure of that, seen fine blanked um, parts. So fine blanking is a sheet metal stamping process um, where you can achieve really high uh, surface qualities, shearing surface qualities. And um, the most prominent part is, may, is uh, maybe the, the latch from, the, um, from a safety belt. Um, where the shearing surface, the, the shearing surface is used as a functional surface. It has to um, resist high tensile uh, stresses um, in case of a crash. Or um, 
the planet carrier here, which is fine blanked and then um, developed with more forming technologies. Um, or other parts, there are up to 250 parts in this BMW X2, mustard colored BMW X2 here. Um, so fine blanking is a really important uh, manufacturing technology for automotive industry and um, especially for safety critical parts. So parts where we want to know where they come from and where we want to know whether they have the performance that is sold to, uh, to maybe BMW. Um, we have a fine blanking machine, industrial grade fine blanking machine. So um, the model name is Fine Tool XFT 2500 Speed. Um, this fine blanking plant, so the, I'm lying here, so the, 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 the press is actually called Fine Tool XFT 2500 Speed. And the whole fine blanking plant is a plant like it's used in industry. Um, and we have this in our machine hall. And it consists of a decoiler where the material, the sheet metal, is fed from a so-called coil. This is just the shape of the sheet metal. Um, it's then forwarded to a leveler, which uh, relieves the material of residual stresses induced to the material um, through the shape of the coil. Um, then through a coil reserve put into the press where the uh, material is lubricated, so we have lubrication in order to reduce um, the stress on the tool and in order to improve workpiece quality. And I will go on later in my talk and talk about lubrication and optimal lubrication because we think this is a really valuable business case for an internet of production and for distributed ledger technology. Um, so on our fine blanking plant, we measure a lot of data. You see uh, the orange part here is the work in progress part. Um, we measure acceleration data, magnetic fields, humidity of the environment, and most importantly on the press we measure um, the stroke and mechanical vibrations. We also measure uh, forces on the tool, and all of this data that we generate um, puts a really huge load on our, um, on our network. So at most of, most of the times we don't have all the data collected and only certain data that we are interested in, like in forces or um, acoustic emissions. So what is the internet of production that I teasered? It's uh, the, our excellent strategy of our university and best represented by um, this small citation. The vision is to enable a new level of cross-domain collaboration by providing semantically adequate and context-aware data from production development and usage in real time on an adequate level of granularity. Um, and it's funded with uh, 52 million euros over six years. Um, and I myself uh, work as a PhD researcher in this Internet of Production, mainly in data analytics and machine learning, um, but also on the use case of distributed ledger technologies. So the first year of the Cluster of Excellence, it started this year, um, was about finding infrastructures that um, enable such an Internet of Production. Um, and when we imagine this gray box here, which represents a, re represents a shop floor of a company um, with maybe a fine blanking line, maybe a high pressure die casting process and um, other machines, um, I told you that this um, generation of data puts a lot of stress on the network. Um, and this architecture, with, which isn't the real um, the real point of my talk today um, was developed in the first year but the interesting part is the secure industrial collaboration here so the connection to a collaborator which could be a company of or which could be another shop floor of the same company 
where we need a secure industrial collaboration, it could also be a competitor of a company. And we think that um, information that we gather on the level of a shop floor could be um, sold through um, secure industrial coll collaboration to competitors. Um, but there we have to raise the question, what is data privacy for manufacturing data? How much knowledge am I willing to sell to my competitors? Um, and this is a, a topic of uh, research that is ongoing right now. So the monetization of manufacturing data. We see internal monetization and external monetization as the two dimensions of uh, monetization. Um, the first internal mon data monetization we see, uh, this was actually a study by McKinsey in 2015, very famous study. Um, we had an oil rig with 30,000 sensors which were collecting data. Um, and the data was stored in data silos and only 1% of those um, 30,000 sensors was used to do predictive maintenance, condition monitoring to detect anomalies, and 99% was just wasted and uh, laid in the silos and was of no support uh, for the optimization um, and predicting acti activities. So we think, this is our working hypothesis, that closed data silos inhibit the pot potential of um, data-driven approaches. The other thing, the external data monetization, we already heard the term digital twin today. So for us, a digital twin, if you have never heard of it, um, maybe imagine such a latch of the safety belt that I showed you, the plastic example. Um, a digital twin of this latch would be, we know exactly how much tensile stress is the latch able to take, which material was it made of, um, what were the forces when the, uh, when the latch was pressed, what was the temperature when it was produced. So um, a really fine, uh, fine in granularity, um, the knowledge about the latch. So we think that the lack of trust along um, value creation change, chains um, prevents the usage of data. So when a company is selling another company, for example, BMW, um, the digital twin of the ledge, um, the BMW is not really sure that the data, or can't be sure that the data is uh, authentic. So. This is our second working hypothesis for the external data monetization. The lack of trust right now prevents integrated usage of available data. So we um, think of five steps to data monetization of a company, um, differentiating between internal and external data monetization. On the internal data monetization, we think that companies have to start to digitize and connect at first, then visualize and analyze their data in order to optimize and realize. And then, on the external side, this is kind of hierarchical, so we all we need this uh, internal data monetization to... Um, we, we, we need this internal data monetization at the beginning in order to enable the external data monetization where we can share data, buy data, and then monetize um, and create data services to work with um, the data and sell maybe a data service to your customers. Um, and in order to unlock the full potential of data monetization, um, internally and externally, we think that all these steps must, um, in, at least for a manufacturing company, have to be fulfilled. And we think that with blockchain or with IOTA, with directed acyclic graphs, um, which enable digital assets to have an owner and to be traded and um, to be immutable, which is necessary in case, for example, for uh, this safety latch, um, 
BMW would only trust the digital twin of the safety latch if the immutability would be guaranteed. So we think this is a viable use case um, for IOTA. Why do we think that this is necessary for small businesses? Um, so not only for small business, but for all businesses, traditional business mod models have traditionally um, something called traditional diminishing returns. So at a certain point for a larger N, where N could be, for example, um, sold latches of the safety belt, we have diminishing returns um, due to operational complexity, administrative costs, or organizational inertia. Um, through internal data monetization, meaning the optimization of your own processes, um, this curve can be raised, but it's still at some point, uh, at a later end, you have, um, still have traditional diminishing returns. Through digital business models, and especially through platforms, you have network effects, which means if I could sell the knowledge that I gain when I produce a uh, latch of a safety belt, for example. Um, if I sell that knowledge, I gain value. Value meaning not only money. Um, value could mean much more for a company. I'm sure that you know that. Um, and through the use of AI, this um, curve, so does the research says, um, can be um, even enhanced. So a use case for that would be, I talked about the lubricant, so we use lubricants and fine blanking in order to reduce the wear of the tool because at a certain point when um, the wear of the tool reaches a critical point, the following parts um, lose the quality. So at a certain point you have to change the tool and then you have to um, you have to pause the production, and this is really costly for small businesses. Um, so the material for the tool is another cost factor, so the lubricant and the lubricant performance is highly economically relevant. Um, and right now the lubricant is developed in local test beds, so I called it now and then. Um, so a, a company manufacturing lubricants um, develops it, tests, tests uh, the lubricant in their local test bed, and we think that the approach to buy data from fine blanking companies um, using the lubricant, for example, forces, acoustic emissions, or whatever, you can imagine whatever data, um, could help the lubricant companies um, to develop their lubricant to be more um, performant and uh, therefore uh, save the fine blanking company a lot of money because they don't have to throw so much uh, parts away. It is uh, better for the resources. And um, the company of the, uh, the, the, the lubricant manufacturer could then even think about selling their knowledge when their lubricant works the best. So when we look, here is the wear of the tool that I talked about. So maybe if they um, add the workpiece geometry to the data set, uh, material and wear related data, um, wear related data, sorry, a business model could be to not only sell the lubricant, but also the knowledge um, when and how to use it when it performs best. And um, through a combination of the available data um, that the lubricant company has and data that they purchase from a company that um, uses the lubricant, they could generate even more value. So a small proof of concept that we developed was, um, I told you that a digital twin is a really fine granular representation of, a, for example, of a workpiece or a process or whatever. In our case, it was a small fine blank workpiece. Um, our digital twin is not as fine Granular. So we only had certain values like the um, maximum process force that the workpiece was produced with, uh, the material type, we had a timestamp, 
Um, we had a value uh, for the die roll, which is kind of a quality defect on the shearing surface. And we, um, we saved this data in a database and through the tangle um, where we posted a public key, so we uh, encrypted uh, the data set and through a public-private key um, method, and then we posted the public key in the tangle and the private key um, was sold over a front end to a user paying with IOTA. And the public key was there to guarantee that the data that you purchase is, um, is the real data. This was just um, necessary not to flood the tangle with data, so we only generated the public key and posted it to the tangle. So I will show you the video. So this is the fine blanking press that you see here. Oh, it doesn't have sound. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, so the lubrication is taking place before the actual blanking process. This is the tool here. And you can you don't see the pieces actually falling out of the fine blanking machine. So those are the process forces that we can measure here, the shearing uh, force, which is calculated from more forces. And those are the parts that are produced and then posted to the tangle. This is the marketplace uh, that we developed. So you can see the green by data here. Um, and you see that uh, the list here is actually a pending. So we have more work pieces getting posted here. And when you click on the by data button, um, you get a QR code. If you scan the QR code and pay um, the requested amount of IOTA, now I have to skip a bit because it takes quite a long time. So now it's scanned and progressing. Uh. Whoops. Now I've broken it. Ah. Unbroken. Okay, so after quite a while, the in inter inter integrity check passed, um, and the data is actually received. You can see here. Um, location, Aachen, machine type is the XFT 2500 speed. We have a machine ID. Um, we have the material, which is 16 mangan chrome 5, the punch force, the punch stroke, the die roll, uh, and the timestamp, which is our small digital twin. Um, that was validated through the tangle and uh, could be bought through paying IOTA. So at um, the 13th and 14th of uh, May in next year, we will have our Aachener Werkzeug Machine Colloquium, which is um, a really big um, which is a really big event, event for um, manufacturing companies from the whole world. And um, we, will tr we will develop our demonstrator even further up until then. And um, we also have expert meetings, and the next expert meeting is on the 7th of 
um, Febu February in Frankfurt. If you want to join, you can shoot me an email. Um, when you think you can um, help us with developing our ideas, um, it's mainly about developing or establishing platforms in manufacturing and using distributed ledger technology to enable that. Any questions? Thank you. Um, that's a good question. So, when you look at, oh no, I have to. So the answer is no. I'll try to... What I wanted to show you is this other field that we have in our marketplace, which is the... Uh, which is here. Uh, the by FEM twin. So FEM, if you have ever heard about it, um, it's a really expensive simulation of a workpiece. You can simulate temperature, stresses, things that you can't really measure in process and you have to simulate. And um, so my colleague developed a system where you can buy such a FEM twin through a simulation server but it only triggers if you have deviations. So if you have deviations from the standard FEM twin. So this could be an approach to only generate a digital twin when, the, uh, when, we, when you have certain process fluctuations where you say it's critical that you need a digital twin because you need to Maybe, f maybe you need different finishing steps for the, for the product. You need different grinding operations in order to finish it. So you don't have to throw away the, the piece, but maybe through different finishing operations, you can like, save it from being thrown to the trash. So this could be a, this could be a possibility. But also to generate a, a digital twin where I know I have a fluctuation, and I want to optimize my process. So in selling knowledge, it's important to find these cases where you don't have the standard twin. But you are right, you don't need a digital twin of every workpiece. So we only wanted to um, show that it's possible to do that um, with a small digital twin, really not that informative, but um, just a proof of concept. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, now, my talk is about um, decentralized data management for IoT data streams using the IOTA Tangle. My name is Rafael Manke. I'm a master student at the FZE. And uh, if you want to contact me, here's my information. Let's start with a little motivation. A lot of uh, IOTA applications is about sharing data. You have normally one step is a measure data, then publishes on the IOTA Tangle and share it. IOTA is all about IoT and peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication. So let's look at some real examples. Maybe you have a uh, fitness tracker or a medical device that tracks your heart rate and several other stuff. Or you have an, a machine that produces data which are sold to other people or even an environmental sensor can be one of these devices. If you publish this to the uh, Tangle, you normally want to share it with someone. For example, the health 
data you want to share with your doctor or your insurance or whatever. Or you want to sell it on a marketplace like the industrial marketplace or the, the data marketplace from the IOTA Foundation. Most of this time there's uh, mask authenticated messaging used. Mask authenticated messaging is a chaining of messages together um, where one message references the next message like here. So there's one part in the message that is uh, help to identify the next message. But you only can go forward and not backward. So you have forward uh, secrecy. The, uh, the ownership of a channel is also um, guaranteed by the signature of the messages. So you can not take over a, a channel without having the seed of this channel. And of course, the message itself. Here's a short uh, overview of one message with the, I don't know, with the signature field and the message itself. But mask as I mentioned, you have three types of sharing the data or accessing the data. One way is the public way. So all your uh, data you're publishing can be read by everyone as long as he knows where it stands and then follow all the f uh, me uh, following messages. A second one is the private one where only you as the channel owner can read the data. And the third one is the restricted mode. And the restricted mode, each message is also encrypted with a so-called side key. This side key encrypts each message and only if you have the side key you can at the end decrypt the message and uh, on the one hand side you can read the message and the address of the next message as well. So how do you share this information about the side key? Normally I want to share data with some pe someone like the, the green person. Then I have to generate my side key encrypt my data with it and send it to this person. This person then can access the message and all the following messages that are encrypted with this side key. So let's think I want to share it with a second person. What happens? I take my side key and send it to him as well and say, okay, you can read a message starting from this point on. So maybe after some time, uh, I don't want that a second person uh, reads this data in the future. So I change my side key and all following mess uh, exchange, uh, send it to the first person and start from this point on um, publishing my messages with this new side key. So only person one has, the first person has access to the newly published messages. But maybe you think already that's a high of communication effort. You have to know where the people are. You always have to send them new side keys and Okay, that's quite some communication effort. Another thing is, what happens um, if I want to sh share old data or old parts of a mom stream? Then we look at this, we have a, a message where a stream where at the beginning there was one person, then two persons uh, access the message, so I have changed the side key, then only another person get part of this message stream and so on and so on. So maybe I want to share at the end because it's my uh, medical data from August until September or whatever, then I want to share only those messages of a mom stream. So how can I do that? I send them this position of the mom stream in a, as an IOTA address along with the two keys he needs to encrypt the messages. But what kind of message I really uh, sold to him were all of those messages that are encrypted with this key. So I sold more messages than I actually wanted. So I cannot share parts of a mom stream with someone. Another thing I already mentioned slightly was I need to keep track of all my subscriptions. I need to know who I have to uh, inform about a new side key, what, who I have to, how do I communicate with them, and so on. And another thing is there's a tight coupling between the data owner, so that the person has control over the data and the mechanism that published the data. For example, if I want to share my data, uh, if I, the, the person who gives access to some data has to inform the mechanism that publishes data that has a new side key to use. So there's a tight coupling between the publishing and the uh, 
publishing and accessing type prison. So now I came up with my approach. My approach is uh, I have two sides. One side is the data sender and the data receiver side on the opposite, whereas the data sender is um, uh, split into a data owner who's the actual person who have control and, um, of the data and controls a data publisher. Data publisher can be a simple device that measures the data and publishes to the tangle without knowing who reads the data. Only th th this all ma um, management of who can read the data, who uh, is allowed and how long can you read the data is done by the data owner. The data owner allows um, an access to the data that is published by the publisher. How it does it do that? Each message is encrypted with a unique side key. So now you think, okay, even more communication effort because I have to send more side keys around with all the people. Actually not, because it's the way of how the side key is calculated. The side key is calculated by a master secret that only the device that published the data is uh, known and the um, manager as, uh, knows it as well. So those, know, uh, they, those have a shared secret or master secret and then the time span of the data point is hashed together and the result of that is a, is a new side key. So how does this hashing work? At the beginning I got a master key uh, which is an uh, address, a uh, key with length from one to uh, no. Then there is the timestamp, like uh, this time spent here from uh, 2019, October the 30th. And each, this is, uh, these are several st steps of the hashing process. At the beginning, there's the uh, year. This, uh, this value is then converted into a binary representation and normalized. Normalized so all uh, keys have the same length at the end. Uh, all parts of this stage have the same length if I convert into binary. And at the end we got, uh, we concatenate all those num normalized binary values and hash it together with, uh, one by one with the master key. So I start by the master key, hash it with zero. The result hash, I hash with zero again and so on along with this normalized key. So you may ask why binary trees and what is the effort or the use, uh, the, 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 the use of it. If you use a binary tree you can you get for example for the stage of a month a tree like this. You have uh, six, 16 leaves uh, for each month one leaf, plus, uh, because it's normalized, uh, three more. That's not really a problem because the application later can uh, handle that. But if you want to share now data from January to until to July, you don't have to um, share all the uh, side keys that are used in this uh, time frame. You only have to share three nodes and have access to all the data that is published in this uh, um, time period, no matter how far data, uh, how many data points there are produced in this time frame. So finally, how do we exchange these keys? Um, my approach, we had a uh, request um, message at the beginning from the receiver side, where the receiver uh, sends a message uh, with, encrypted with uh, the public key of the data owner which then decrypts the message, can decide if he accepts or decline the message, if he declines uh, the request to, to access the data, um, uh, he gets a reject message. If he accepts the request, then the owner, uh, the owner has to get the current position in the, in the mum stream, calculate, calculate the subtree, the, I showed in the previous slide, create a message with only those, those subnodes in this uh, binary tree, and then the receiver can start reading the keys, uh, the, the data points. So this my approach uh, is possible to exchange a period of time uh, of data points with only one key exchange. 
you have a separation of a data owner and data publisher, so the data owner can only concentrate on managing the subscription, whereas the device itself uh, publishes data. You can, um, act, uh, you can define fine-grained access of parts of data streams. You can even share only one data point by just uh, calculating side key from, from this data point and uh, share it with someone. And you can have different people with different times of access by just sending different subtrees, uh, even for, further, uh, for data points in the future or past. But the disadvantage is you have, at the beginning, a quite bigger message because maybe there are more keys to exchange than just one side key. Maybe you have up to 10, 15 side keys between the, uh, or parts in the tree, so it's about a little bit more than just one side key. You can only share predefined time ranges, so you cannot uh, give someone access to a stream and sometime after you say, now you're, you're, you're not allowed to, you must define this time range at the beginning because uh, you have to calculate the subtree for this time range. And once uh, you, you share this information, you cannot revoke the access only by changing the master key, which might, uh, is quite difficult or high of effort. So let's have a quick demo. I recorded this because I have, last time it didn't work on a live demo. <laughs> um, I have a web app where it all, uh, where these three parties are shown with uh, as a receiver, owner, and publisher. So let's create an owner by generating a random seed, giving it an ID and some master secret. That's my owner. Now I need to create a data publisher. Also has a seed, an ID, and the same secret. That's important. And this time we just publish in timestamps for simplicity. So let's start with publishing data. Now the mom stream is created and uh, publishing the, the timestamp every 10 seconds. So you can see the publisher, uh, the owner itself has access to the messages, so he can read the data itself. And now let's get over to the receiver part. Now some receiver is created, also with a seed and an ID. And the receiver now uh, uh, makes a request to access the data for a specific time frame. At the moment, there are no requests open or active. So he requests the data from yesterday, from this owner, with, from this publisher of this owner. So the request is submitted. That's actually a, a traceable message in the Tangle as well. So you can, at the end, uh, trace all the communication between the parties. So the owner can uh, regularly check if there are new requests for data, yeah, there is one. Uh, from this receiver, with a start and end date, and accept or reject the request. That's accepted. Now the receiver also can check if, he, if his requests have been accepted or rejected. Therefore, he has to reload. And now we have one active request with the start address of the mum stream, a start and end date, and also a data connection, so we can fetch the messages from the Tangle. And there we are. Now there's a little bit more because it took some time, but now we can read all the data automatically ending after the uh, requested time frame. Thank you. It's quite a lot, I think. <laughs> Maybe quite technical. Yes? Just to uh, understand it, uh, so you need, you show the, the tree of uh, one of your slides where you just needed to publish the um, key of the node in the upper left. It's just because of the hashing that goes down. 
Yes, genau, downwards. So um, that's the, the, the level of months. So uh, next there's a tree. Where's my mouse? There. Uh, on the, if you have, to, uh, the, for example, the month May, now you start get generating a tree with uh, 32 leaves and go from this hashing value down the tree again by hashing it with 01 according to the path to this uh, day tag or the timestamp. Um, yeah, and then the ending result is the side key. And the information which date uh, timestamp is used is actually published in the tag field of the transaction. So you can, that's publicly available, uh, publicly readable, uh, the tag, and then he you know, has to check do I have a key or a sub part of this key so I can calculate this one key from it. Yes? Uh, we are talking about uh, one single channel and the time frame for when you, you have access to these and when, you, when your access ends. Do you have some idea how to implement it for a system of, let's say, many thousands of machines with many single data points where you are going to have some subscription on just a few of them? Is there a way to transfer this model to giving access to um, yes, if you don't, uh, if, you, if you transfer this binary tree to a machine, so each machine is one p uh, leaf of this tree, so you can share uh, parts uh, of machines, but the binary tree makes the little problem that um, it's good for time series data because um, all the data is ongoing from here on. So if I know this leaf, I can calculate all these data. If I, if I have several machines, I have to cut them in a different way, maybe. Uh, so it's not, at the end, maybe I only share single keys to each machine. You know what I mean? It's a little bit difficult to yeah. group the machines. Yes, actually. Yeah. <clears throat> Very warm.